Hello, good morning. Hope you're all well. Um, this isn't the Hugh Grant session, so that's next door. So if you are here for him, unfortunately I am not him, as you can see. Um, today um, we're going to talk about um, sort of creativity and science and where they merge and do they merge and are they complementary or are they at, at war with each other and it's quite an interesting session today so please 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 if you have any questions and there is a poll going on open the app uh, navigate to the session and ask away for questions for the Q&A at the end or actually to vote on the idea you think is the best now creative towards computers who is smarter than the robot are we smarter than robots is that is that actually a thing? And the answer is yes, it is a thing. Now we are fully aware of it all. Now before we get into the meat of the matter, my name is Christian House. That's my special cufflink shot that was specially made for this, uh, for this show. Um, I don't normally, well actually I always look like that, so I would be lying if I didn't. And joining me today uh, are three titans of television. I'm not doing this journey alone. We have Anna Demores from Shiver. We have uh, Edward Phillips from 2-4 and Katie Thorogood from Ricochet. Now that's them as children, not now. <laughs> just, to, just not to disappoint you. Um, now, a bit about me. I love data, and I've been working in data for about 25 years, so I'll sort of give my age away. Uh, I am 33. Um, um, now, I, I do love data, and I've done lots of data analysis for lots of brands, lots of businesses, and lots of content creators and providers. Um, for example, I can tell you how to make the best bacon sandwich, um, and I use this information with Fresh One for Jamie Oliver. Luke's laughing, remember that? Um, so obviously it's grilled and with tomato sauce. That's crowdsourced from the whole world of social media talking about bacon sandwiches. I actually got a president elected. No, not this one, this one. I worked on Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 doing a data analysis from mybarackobama.com. Um, I can tell you when is best to market Guinness and what picture of the pint to use using data. And that's something I do regularly. I don't drink Guinness, but I can tell them how to actually market it. And finally, uh, I can turn the world of data and social media on TV. This is an entire series of Big Brother, not the current one, this is a few years old. But each colour is a housemate, each peak and trough is, a, is an action, an interaction, a fight, a kiss, um, something unsavoury and an eviction. Now I used this data and created a model in 2008 which we could predict who would be evicted each week. Because obviously people vote by talking and they talk you know, like we all do socially, uh, in that stream of subconscious that surrounds us all on the internet. And I built a model which could predict each week with high success rates. So I got it right, I got it wrong once in 26 tries, and I made a lot of money from Betfair before they suspended my account. And it's, <laughs> and it's actually why I'm in this room today, because that, that was my break, okay? My break in the world of media, not in the world of data. Because by, by creating a very, very simple algorithmic model, I could look at you lot talking about programs and then turn it on the program itself. And then I started working for Endemol and Big Brother and actually started to use this information to help them in production and also front of camera, feeding back the input from the audience to the show and becoming on the show. So it became a quite an interesting thing for me where the world of data and creativity started to combine. Now obviously everyone talks about storytelling and everything else. Data is a really good way of taking some information and then turning it into something which is relative and relatable to the audience and then feeding it back to them. Now where we are today, I'm going to talk about AI. Okay, so obviously AI is a buzzword we've all heard of, and we all like know what it is, what it means, but here it is. So like the BBC, I'm here to entertain and inform you. Um, what is AI? AI is artificial intelligence, the concept of machines being able to carry out tasks we would consider to be smart. Okay, so there are, it's split into two sections. This is the science bit, so you can turn off if you want for now. So there's applied, which is things like autonomous driving, fraud detection when we use our cards, and stock trading. So that's effectively the boring stuff. Even things like chatbots, you know, when we're on, a, on, the internet, on that internet they have these days, and you are interacting with a page, and suddenly a chat window comes up, and you think, oh, I'm talking to someone, and they're real. I'm sorry, but they're not real. It's a computer. Right? It's, it's a process, it's a flow. Um, and then there's generalised, which is systems that can handle any task. Now this is the thing maybe you should be scared of, because it's when you start to turn the computer at the expertise and the things that probably are in this room. Okay? Now an example of the first... Oh, there's a, there's a video missing. Um, there was a, I had an example of the first, which is my car parking itself. Now, I don't have a flash car, but I press a button, and now, because I can't be asked to park, it actually just goes into a space, and it can get into the smallest spaces that I can never try, because I don't have the spatial awareness. And it's when you start to think about the convenience that AI can give you, it, it becomes like, well, that's the boring, mundane stuff, but can it challenge 
what you do? Can it ideate? Can it create ideas? Can it actually, from beginning, middle, and end, think about how to create a TV show? And you're going to say, no, it can't. And I'm going to say, yes, it can. And we're going to have that tension throughout this whole session. Um, <laughs> now, some other useful terms uh, are machine learning. Everyone's heard of machine learning? Oh, we, I, I don't know the video. It's fine. Uh, machine learning, using techniques and data to actually try and test and learn and do things. Now, in the, in the slide I said you need to do it by shit, feeding it a shit ton of data. Um, the reason why AI and machine learning are so prevalent now is because the thing called the internet happened, right? The internet happened, and suddenly we're all creating so much information, and there's so much information free-flowing between each other, between computers, between neural networks, between basically everyone, that that information now allows us at scale to start to do things and to do things better using data. Uh, and the final helpful term, helpful tip, is neural networks, which is effectively, because there's so much data, because there's a shit ton of data everywhere, how do I make sense of it all? How do I know what to look for? How do I know what to ask? And neural networks effectively replicate the way a brain works. Okay, so they say, well, I'm going to classify that data in the way that a human being does, which is quite difficult. It's actually the most difficult thing, because actually no one really knows how the, how the brain works. Um, now, this is, I'm expecting you all to learn this, by the way, because I am testing it at the end, and you can't leave until you tell me what this means. Um, now, in order to go forward, we need to go back. Now, part of the challenge I've set today is um, I built a regression model which looks at the last 50 years of viewing stats and viewing data. On top of that model, I put you know, political party in power, the inflation rate, how people felt, um, you know, economic events, all that sort of context which normally is lost, okay, or not used. And now by putting those two things together, I can spit out a prediction. So the challenge here was what, are people, what will people be watching in 2019 and 2020? Okay, so any commissioners room, this is the time to watch. I'm going to throw through some facts that came out from that regression and uh, predictive model. Um, and by the way, that's R. So any technical people in there, that's a bit of R and I can tell you about it later. Um, so the most talked about topics this year, social media, health inequality in World War III, these haven't changed in nearly a year and a half. This is everyone talking about things, the general topics. It's not cats, it's not Love Island, it's I want to lose weight, I'm too fat, um, isn't the world unequal, and oh my God, we're all going to die. That's basically the, the sum up of all the discussions that are happening in all forms of media and social media. And then we can start to look at things like how people feel. So our overall, all the messages, are they positive or negative? As we can see here, going into 2020, things are going to get worse from a point of view of the messages being portrayed. Uh, unemployment rates, protection, inflation, yada, yada, yada. The weather's going to get hotter and colder. So uh, hotter winters are colder. And that's based on the Met Office data fed into the, into the model. Um, and as you can see, it, you can get quite into this. Now, there are hundreds of different data points. I'm not going to talk them all through you because I'll be here till next Edinburgh. Now, um, where it gets interesting, right, when I feed that into the model, it starts to stick, stick out things that what type of shows will people watch? And there hasn't been much change, really. So in 2019, it's saying the most popular show will be entertainment. I think it's always been entertainment. But in 2020, reality slash game show. Um, what are the themes? What themes will people be interested in? Uh, and they're quite dark. Um, catastrophic event and crime in 2019. And in 2020, artificial intelligence and inequality. Now, two things to pull out here is um, the top five results that my system spat out from show synopses were all about end of the world. So the computer <laughs> thinks that the end of the world is coming. Uh, and, then, uh, and then in 2020, artificial intelligence, are, are you all aware of the singularity or the technical singularity? It's the point where the machine becomes better than us. Are you all aware of that? Yeah. You should be. It's pretty scary. Now, Elon Musk, that man who is taken over Donald Trump as the worst tweeter, um, has... <laughs> Has, um, has predicted that it will happen in 2026. So he thinks computers will suddenly be better than us at in 2026, which is only six years away from that. Whereas Google thinks it's about 2045. So that's the time to get in your bunker, build your cabin, you know, sort of put bromide tablets in your water because things are going to get very hairy. Um, and then things like how much TV hours people will watch, et cetera, et cetera. And when the best time to put shows on. So it's sort of creating from all that information a template, if you like, a formula of what would work for a certain audience a general audience, not just a London audience, not just a metropolitan audience, but a, a UK-wide audience. Now, before I read out the ideas, I would like our panellists to come on stage. So, Anna, please come up first, and please give them a round of applause. 
Then Ed. And finally, Katie. Welcome, welcome. Now, I think we can stop riding the Valkyries. That was intentional. Now, I have four ideas on these cue cards that I assembled myself. One is upside down. Don't read anything into that. Um, these four ideas, three have come from the creative genius that is in front of us and their teams, and one has come from my humble IBM Watson instance. So you're, it's your job to a, vote for the one you think is best, and then while you're voting, I'm going to ask you which one you think was the, you know, is the computer-generated one. So a bit like faking it, but not as slick. <laughs> right, so I'm going to read these out on my best RADA um, voice. And I'm not going to apply any sort of logic or any over-the-topness to it, apart from me. So, the first, first, uh, the first idea is called Summer of 89. So, dating today, swipe left, swipe right, a brutal world based on physical looks. It's especially terrifying if you've been back in the dating pool after 20 years. And we all know that feeling. You've lost your confidence, you're feeling bruised by love, and as a newly single parent, you haven't got time for yourself, let alone dating. But perhaps Sher had the answer when she sang those immortal words in 1989. Do you believe in love? <laughs> Do you believe in love? If I could turn back time. <laughs> 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 so what if we could? We will create a summer camp for single parents and their kids that becomes a 1989 bubble. The music, the food, the fashion. No phones, no iPads, kids have freedom to roam, uh, parents have freedom to mingle. Why? Why, you ask? Because studies have shown that indulging in nostalgia makes us all feel more optimistic, and by channeling our inner teenager, we lose our inhibitions, much to the kids' embarrassment. It's a love show on two levels, by taking our single parents back to a time when they had independence without responsibility, will it open their eyes to, and hearts to romance? And by ditching their phones, it's a chance to reconnect with the kids and celebrate the love between the parent and the child. So that's idea number one. Number two, by the way, I'm going to talk a lot, sorry about this. <laughs> Idea number two, gold. Eight strangers have been dumped deep in a remote wilderness. Piled up next to them is more gold than they can possibly carry. It's a life-changing fortune. It's also extraordinarily heavy. A single bar weighs as much as 12 bottles of wine. <laughs> or 10 bottles of Prosecco. That's my bit. Um, our cast has been given just 14 days to reach a helicopter located, four, located 400 miles away. Whatever gold they can carry is theirs to keep, but if they miss a the pickup, they go home empty-handed. Every bar is worth a fortune, but it will also slow the group down. It's a nail-biting playoff of risk against greed. And because not everyone will be able to carry the same amount, it will also reveal hidden truths about our society. Will the strongest choose to leave the weak behind? Will the group work together and split the spoils evenly? Or might they even decide to give more to those who are in need? Drama, greed, danger. This is gold. Number three. Are you all listening? Are you all keeping up? No one's asleep, yeah? <laughs> Without a trace. Game show. Contestants have to live tech-free in their normal environment for a couple of weeks. Is it possible to live analogue in a digital world? Is it? And there are example game tasks. So, getting a taxi, navigating around, uh, knowledge gathering, writing, making food. Will you be able to complete those tasks completely analog like our parents used to? Contestants will get points for speed of completing a task and for how well the task is completed. The show would be a precursor to learning how to integrate the two in a healthy, balanced way. It is a window into the very hearts of the human condition, covering topics such as competition, addiction, and mental well-being. And the final one, number four, friends on benefits. Is it true that it's not what you know, but who you know that really matters? In each episode, one person on benefits moves in with a privileged person of the same age. The cast will be different every time, with the rich contributors going from self-made entrepreneurs to posh millennials living off mum and dad. And the poor contributors go from a disabled person who can't find a job, despite all efforts, to a lazy youngster who sees no point in working if they can get benefits instead. What will they learn from each other? And can there ever be true friendship across the wealth divide? 
Will having a friend in high places transform the life of friends on benefits? Now, there you're four. So, have you got your phones open? Got your phones open? Got the app? So, would you please vote away for, the, for the, your favourites? And once you've done that, let me know, and I will ask you another question. Go! <laughs> the app's not working. Is that real? <laughs> it's working, yeah. I've just heard in my ear it's working. It's, it's quite, quite tense, isn't it? Very tense. So, you've heard four ideas. Mm-hmm. Have you got a favourite? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is it your own idea, your favourite? Oh, um... <laughs> Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. How are you all doing? Are you all voting okay? It's just taking a bit of time. It's just taking a bit of time. So I keep talking? Yeah. While you're finding it, I'm going to ask another question. This is a supplementary free question, and you can use your hands for this. Right, which one do you think is the artificial intelligence? Number, is it A? Show hands for A. We've got one, two, three, B. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, C. Ooh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, eight, seven, <laughs> seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Oh yeah, of course. You're giving it away. And D. One, two, three. Right, okay. Interesting. Have you all voted? No. God, how come on? This is like how millionaire works. So, all, all feeling good? Not hung over or anything from last night? You're done now, yeah? Are you all in? Done. Yeah, done. Done. All done. It's tense, isn't it? We have the result. We have the result. Am I going to click through to result? Yes. Look at that. So, your favourite idea is gold. With, without, <laughs> with summer camp in second place, Friends of Memphis third, and without trace, last. Now, I can exclusively reveal here today that the AI one was without trace. So We are still necessary. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Just Give yourselves a round of applause for being human. <laughs> now. Are you smarter than a computer? Yes, that's the end of the session. Yeah, let's go. Thank you very much. Going Thanks for voting and thanks for putting up with that music. Now, um, we've got lots of questions, and sorry I had to sit down slowly there. I've just had a week in Greece and I'm a bit heavier than I was last time I wore these trousers. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> now panellists, hello. Hello. Are you surprised by the results? Um, Without a trace was interesting because that's the idea that almost every intern has when they arrive on their yeah. first day and they have their idea, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. If, that's, if it's already doing what an intern could do, yeah. That's quite impressive. You know, how much longer would it take before it could do what a computer, could, before a, you know, it could do what a producer could do? And I think that's a really interesting point. So obviously, the model is built just on that data that I provided. It doesn't have what's in your brains. It doesn't have the, the notions of what worked before and what hasn't worked before. It doesn't have the notion of the relationship with the, with the commissioner. It has none of that relationship stuff that you all effectively and have. Also, I think with I think with that one, it 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 lacked. Um, heart or, yeah. or, or in, in its execution what what was it going to do what was it going to say about human behavior how would people change through that process uh, so it, it yeah. yeah you could you could feel it and, and, and again because it's a computer yeah. sticking out some words yeah. which yeah. might make a bit of sense yeah that's effectively what it did so you're absolutely right um but does it i mean some people here voted and liked it and some people didn't pick it as as the ai one so you know give yourselves um sort of a round of applause um which is quite interesting because yeah. i because i expected either everyone not to get it you know, yeah. or, or to get it you know so i mean does it worry you no i think in in a way it's quite interesting should we say which one was each of our ideas, I don't know. If yes, you can. So who, who, uh, who won? Stand up, who won? I won. Who <laughs> <laughs> came second? Katie came second. I love that idea, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and you, you came third. Yeah, it was my team. Nothing to do with me. <laughs> had one, it would have been my idea. In this case, someone would get fired. You told me it was Tim Carter's idea. <laughs> it was Tim Carter's idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, I, and I came last. But by the way, anyone wants to commission these, I get 5%. I might just say that. 
So can you give a brief overview of your development team? You just, you've, just, yes. you've just sort of slagged them off a bit there, but can you, um, <laughs> let, and how your team works? No, they're great, they're a great team. Um, we have a head of development, Aidan Hensel, and then we are split between London and Manchester. So in London, we have a team of six people between APs and producers, and then we have three people in Manchester, producer, an AP and a researcher. Shiva has a sort of very broad remit. We make everything from Tonight and Martin Lewis' money show all the way to entertainment shows. So the team works across all the genres. We're similarly broad in that we go right from kind of, you know, entertainment shows like Splash and the Jump, you know, right the way through to documentaries like Educating. And our development team reflects that. So at the top, we've got Johnny Collar, our group develop, uh, director of development. Then we've sort of got four producers uh, all, all around about to that level, uh, an AP, a couple of researchers and a couple of interns. And they're, and they're quite a broad church. So they range from kind of people who started out in specialist factual right through to kind of games producers. And the way we work is to get all of those different minds in a room to keep everything as broad as possible and to get lots of different perspectives. Mm. Okay. And Katie? Yeah, we're sort of four to eight. I mean, there's no great secret. We brainstorm like everyone else brainstorms. I'm normally the miserable bugger in the room because I freaking hate brainstorms, um, which, which, is, which, is not, which is not a great thing. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, we're, we're constantly thinking about the channels. That's, that's, that's our life, thinking about what, you know, mm -hmm. if you've got a meeting up for Channel 4, a meeting up with BBC, you're, you're focused towards them. So it's contextual to who you're trying to sell to, basically. Exactly. So, so I mean, ideation is a, a big part of this. Um, and obviously, AI spats some ideas based on some data. I mean, do you obviously, how do you come up with the ideas, you know, the slates, if you like, when you're, when you're creating an idea and, 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 a, and a treatment? And we'll start with Ed. Go in the middle first. Thanks. So... I guess the first thing is that creating, having the idea in the first place is by far the most difficult bit of the job and it's the bit that makes me lose the most sleep. So I always think you're best at the start of the day, the first hour is your best hour, so we try and get everyone in a room first thing every morning. And almost more than like the games we use and the props we use, it's sort of about making sure that the energy in the room is really high, everyone is really fresh and everyone feels empowered you know, and, and everyone believes that if they have an idea that's really good, it will be on the slate, it will be in front of a commissioner tomorrow, and it could be the idea that makes their career. And, and right from the interns up to, you know, my level and above, everyone sort of believes that they can do it. I think that's probably the, the most important thing about how we generate. And what's the source? What's the, what's the, the, ne the, the nebulous of, of an idea? Is it what you read? Is it what's on the mail online? Is it... We do everything. I mean, I mean, obviously I've worked with Anna. So, I mean, we do sort of development games. We'll look at, you know, film trailers. We'll look at books. We'll look at the papers. I've even tried kind of like, like weirder stuff, like making people have a walk alone in the park or in pairs. I've made people sit in <laughs> silence for 15 minutes, which is incredibly oh, unpopular. <laughs> you know, we've done word association. People have looked at clouds. I mean, like, you name it, we've tried it. We've kind of scientifically tried to try. <laughs> Everything sometimes sometimes I worry that I can't of. think of an idea of a new way of brainstorming, let alone an idea for a new program. It's true, though, though. That. that's yeah. so important, because I yeah. think there is a, a real danger of, of getting attached to the same games. Yeah. Again, I mean, my heart sinks when people go, oh, let's mix a format with, you know, an old format with a new format, and you go, Jesus Christ, and you're going to have the same ideas. And it's, 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 it's really tricky. The bar is so high. There's so many indies out there. There's so many talented people. Only so many slots. Everyone is going after the same business. We are all trying, to, and it's inevitable that, that people are going to be coming up with the same ideas. I think we've all been there when you read about a commission and you go, I had that idea before. And so much of it depends on timing and relationship. But there is a real challenge, I think, for all of us to try to come up with ideas in new ways. I think that's why it's really important for teams to be really diverse. And I mean that in the broadest possible sense, because if everyone in your team is reading The Guardian, and watching Love Island and having the same, you know, echo chamber on the Facebook, um, and you're only going to come up with the same things. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to be really clever when you hire, when you're putting a development team together, to to go out of your comfort zone and hire people that are not part of your. They might not have the same beliefs. You might have to hire, you know, a Tory or someone else. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's controversial, but uh, you know, have someone who hasn't gone because I think there is a real. You must, there is this tendency of you going, okay, it's really hard to find good development uh, producers and APs and all that. And you, it's very easy to just go, oh, they have a first from Oxbridge, they will be good. Mm. But if you only have people in your team that have a first from Oxbridge, you're only going to have the same pool of ideas. And I think that's a real thing. I, I really enjoy when I go up to Manchester to brainstorm with the guys. We always come up with really different ideas because I think they just have a different life. 
And I think me, I, I didn't grow up in Britain. Mm. And I think for, to this day, there are people that are still a bit surprised, sometimes in a patronizing way, sometimes in a nice way. Like, oh, it's so good that you've done so well with, you know, <laughs> being foreign. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I, I genuinely think it's an advantage because I didn't grow up watching the same kids' yep. shows and you know, reading the same books, and I think that's good to having the mix. I mean, I mean, I agree. I mean, for me, adjacency. So obviously, you know, you're right. You look at the same pool of people who have the same friends, and actually, it's it's in the next cohort of people where often, you know, innovation will come, and it, and that adjacency. And just again, just just on that, you talk about ideas being difficult. My machine's about out 800 ideas. So I only, I only chose the first one, and one Why of them. Why are they any good, Christian? Well, I tell you what, the Great British Rake Off <laughs> was my was my personal favourite. Um, I'm not sure you could use that title. We we, we <laughs> took out of um, your themes nostalgia. That's how we got to summer camp '89 because. Um, uh, when we started looking into it, apparently um, uh, that nostalgia is really working for young people. Mm. So Adidas bringing out Adidas gazelles and everything. Oh. Um, the, the, young, the youngsters are loving looking back. And I think when everything's gone to shit, um, you just want to feel you just want to feel somewhere where that's inclusive, that looks fun. And that multi-generational sort of family and love thing was incredibly feel good. But if yours, if yours did 800 ideas, when we were looking at nostalgia, <laughs> thinking our other two were, were disco wheels, a panel show where everyone's on roller boots. And, um, and this one's genius, I think, fuzzy felt challenge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we went with summer camp 89. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so, I mean, and then uh, so diversity or uh, the ability to bring from adjacent is important to, to you as well. Yeah, absolutely. So our team has a very light split between kind of like uh, that sort of entertainment specialists and you know sort of more factual people. But actually, when we brainstorm, all the best stuff happens when there's cross pollination between the two halves. Mm -hmm. You know, so we try and get both sets together in a room as much as possible. Yeah. And how do you stop yourself being the negative old bitch, which is what I am, that's, Channel 4 did that five years ago. <laughs> I've seen a taster tape on that a million times. Because we make everyone do that. That's, that's how we run. So I, I used to have an AP. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to have an AP who I used to call the head of nobody would want to do that, Ed. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, but it's really important that everyone on the team can speak the truth to power and that they don't mind turning you down. And, you know, and, yeah. and, and that's the first bit of learning how to have a good idea is probably to be able to separate the wheat from the chaff. So we, you know, so we make sure that everyone does a little bit of that so that I don't have to do it all the time. Mm. So, going back to obviously the challenge, I, I gave you some data, and how did you interpret it? I mean, did you, did you look at it any differently than you do anything else, or did you, how did you read it? Uh, it was really useful just, just to have some starting points, just to say, oh right, we're just going to talk about inequality, or for you I suppose well, it, to be able to talk Yes, about. Although, although sort of, you know, great insight, in it, people are talking about inequality, I sort of think, obviously, I can feel it, I yeah. mean, we, yeah. you know, so, so there was nothing... I thought I thought the data was good. I thought the data would give, if I'm really honest, was going to be more surprising and make yeah. me go, oh, okay. Mm. But you sort of know it. So as development teams, we endlessly debate around those areas anyway. So I think was, it's always about focus, isn't it? So it was almost so broad it could have covered any idea, which is why we narrowed down to nostalgia and you, you narrowed inequality, to inequality, yeah. and you, you were sort of survival almost. Well, yeah. Catastrophe, yeah. Catastrophe. Yeah, yeah. catastrophe. Well, in a, it was inequality. The thought was every show about inequality is just focused on bringing the rich face to face mm. with the poor. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, sort, yeah. Of, sort of like that. Or, um, you know, the week the landlords moved in, rich yeah. house, yeah. poor house. And, and actually, there's no show that examines how we got yeah. to now. Yeah. So we thought we'd construct a social experiment mm. that did that. Mm. So, um, I mean, obviously, so the data was, as I said, it was broad, but also quite narrow on purpose, because obviously, yeah. if I'd just yeah. given you everything, you'd, you, you know, you wouldn't, we wouldn't be sitting here, you'd still be looking at it. So, it, and also the predictions, so for example, the, after we met and I gave you that information, like the interest rates went up, which mm. is effectively what the model said would happen. And it's quite interesting that actually, you know, there is a pattern to that, and, but there may not be a pattern yet to creating a TV show. Now, obviously saying that AI can do those types of things, what do you think AI can't do now or yet? Relationship with the commissioning editor, and in yeah. the end it all comes down to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I I think it's exciting what AI might be able to do in terms of uh, tapping into the data and what's out there what, and generating starting points. But I think then you have to work with that, is what you do with it. Because as Katie is saying, it's so important, the relationship, it's timing, is being able to respond to how the commissioning editor responds. I, I don't know anyone 
who've got anything commissioned just by sending an idea, literally, and I just think, how about this? And that was like, yes, I, I, I think it's unheard of. So I think it's, you always have to, to work on top of, of this, the first thought. And I don't know if AI will ever be able to do that, maybe it will. Well, there's AI, <laughs> AI commissioners. <laughs> <laughs> just just commi machines talking yeah. to each other, and creating yeah. shows. Um, Ed, I mean, what do you, what about the response commissioners? Do you, what, what do you think about? So it's really important. So. Like to give an example, when we were developing Marigold, so we were sort of fresh out of educating, which had, you know, which had sort of done really well, educating Yorkshire, and we were, and we, that had sort of made heroes of teachers, and we were looking for the next cast of people that we could turn into heroes, and the team kind of quite firmly latched onto the idea that that would be care home staff. So educating began uh, as an idea, you know, it was, it was going to be a rig in a care home, which might have been quite bleak, and you know, and the channel sort of rightly sent us away, and they said, no, 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 it's not that. So we sort of thought more, and then inspired by the film, we started looking at the real Marigold Hotel, and originally that was going to be done with ordinary pensioners, mm. you know, so it was going to, you know, so we, we spent sort of weeks working out, you know, what does life in India look like on the average state pension? Who could we look at there? I think we've got... I think we've got, we, we have, have, actually, we've got a video of the initial, was it initial? So this is the original, or the, this is the first 90 seconds of the original, uh, of the original tape that was funded uh, for this by Channel 4. Channel 4 telling us no, we would never have made that version of the tape. And actually Channel 4, I think it would be fair to say that they hated that version of the tape as well. So we took it um, <laughs> pretty much everywhere, uh, but it was the BBC that really latched onto it. Uh, and then from the BBC, they then said to us, no, don't do it with real people, put celebrities on. And, that, and that, was, that was how the show came about. So the commissioners were sort of as important or more important to that idea than we were. Hmm. And, and Katie, we were talking earlier about emotion. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's a, a huge part of all jobs, yeah. but especially in this yeah. job, because you're tapping into that very need for emotion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, I think all... Um the, the, the programmes that stay with you are, 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 are where, you, where you absolutely recognise um, human, beh human behaviour and, and have empathy with it. And so, um, yeah, show that we developed the, the repair shop, um, which, is, which goes out on BBC Two at 6.45, and it's a, if people haven't seen it, it's a bunch of craftsmen in a bar, and they, in a barn, not a bar, <laughs> and, they fix, um, and they fix up people's cherished but broken items. So there's no money, there's no transaction, there's no how much is it worth. Um, uh, but that came out of, uh, my mum had died, and a couple of years later I had her, her chair upholstered, and I was completely blown away when the chair when the re-upholsterers brought the chair back in, and I just burst into tears because I felt like I'd done right by her. And then thought, maybe there's a programme idea in this. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, but also it came, out of, it came out of the context of telly at the time, which, which a computer can't do. So, so the telly at the time was, was, was uh, and, and still is, um, first dates where you have a precinct and you put stories through it, tattoo fixes where you have a precinct and you put stories through it. So it was like, how do we, how do, we do that but, 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 but in this world? So let's create the workshop, let's light it beautifully and let's push the stories through it rather than going out and visiting the, 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 the craftsmen. And that was, um, that was done with Carla Maria at the BBC, who championed it. And if you get a commissioning editor that's willing to champion and fight for your project, you're, you're, you're halfway there. And I think we've got a video of... So, the, yeah, this is a little bit of the... Um, it was originally an eight-minute taster tape. This is the first minute, I think. You talked about just in that you had the idea yeah and you had, you had strong support was the idea enough or did you have to use other materials in order to get that sort of away um we i think Carla maria had heard similar stuff before because um that whole reusing thing was 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 out there there were the vintage fairs where people were starting to do it so she'd heard similar before but then um, when we sent the treatment in, she actually um, a few weeks later picked it up and, and read it. And I think, which was <laughs> <just> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and so you, got, you, you get the phone call, which you never normally get of, I've read your treatment. I think, there's, I think there's something really good in this. And it wasn't a complicated treatment. It was two or three pages. Um, after that, we did the taster tape. We got, we got funding for it. Whatever, whatever they, I can't remember what they gave us, but we would have spent, spent double because you always, you always do if you've got a funded development. Um, and then she just pushed it through the system. Oh, great.
And what I'd say is that, um, as we were discussing before, just an idea normally isn't enough, and you know, commission editors are getting similar ideas all the time, and there is the pressure to do more with your pitch and do taster tapes, and I think those are beautifully done tasters that were clearly funded and clearly the companies got behind. But even if you're a smaller taste, uh, a smaller indie, and you don't have the resources to do that, and you haven't got to pay development yet, I think there are ways of you know working on an idea and doing something that will make people sit up and pay attention and, and bring humour to the pitch that you can do if you have the right people in your team that can do something. So we have the example of something we used for um, a chiva for all-star musicals that was done just in-house with no money, uh, but it's an example of something that you can do to, to help with your pitch as well. We've got the nameplate as well, very, very professional. <laughs> Um, so, and that works? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing else is needed. Well, it gives you something to talk around, it doesn't does. it? And it gets a reaction. You... I mean, it was a little bit of a gamble because this, we, we took it to Kevin Liger. Yeah. And I don't know, he might just like hate it, but got a laugh, you know, she loved it, was, yeah. she was laughing. We hadn't showed it to her before, which again was a bit of a gamble, but we wanted a genuine reaction, just yeah. like the comedy of those faces. Um, and it's something that, as I say, it was a, my brilliant team's producer and AP in a day. I just said, we thought, we need something else to help with the pitch. Can you just put this together? And they did. Um, so that's useful to have. I think when you're hiring people these days, having people that can do that is worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Great. Um, now, Katie, I've got, another, yes. I've got a leading question for you because yes. you've sat on both sides of the fence. Yes. Apparently, I don't yes. know, but you have. Yes. Yes. Um, do you have to change the way that your brain mindset. works? And and also, what's it like receiving treatments? Uh, well, when in, when you're a, when you're a commissioning editor, you're deluged uh, all day. You can feel very self-important, and you're answering lots of emails, and you're going to back-to-back -back meetings, and. Um, you're running around and you really feel like you're justifying your salary and then you swap to go to an indie and no one emails you and <laughs> your inbox is empty and you start getting excited when the, you know, we're having a fridge clear out Friday email comes round, um, uh, which, is, which is ricocheted, that's once a week we get that email. Um, uh, and, and so you, you sort of go from having to react to things, because on commissioning you're constantly being thrown things and you have to react to them, to the scariest thing, which is a blank screen of like, Jesus, we've, I've, you've got to make something happen from scratch. And the, wee, the rewiring that I found I had to do in my head is, um, again, with, with commissioning, there's very few slots and loads and loads of ideas. So you, you become really used to and well-trained to say no. And I found when I made the switch over that I was saying no to the development team instead of thinking, hang on a minute, perhaps, mm. perhaps yes. So I was really doing that thing of, I've seen that taster tape. I've, I've, you know, I've been pitched that a million times before. Because in the end, it's all about timing and it's all about the relationship with the commissioning editor and it's all about whether they've got the right slot at the right time. So I had to retrain my brain from, to, from saying no to saying yes. Um, I'd say that's the biggest difference. And people, you're not as popular as you were. That's the other big difference. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Ed, in your experience, are all commissioners the same? Do they respond to ideas in the same way? Uh, it's difficult to say no. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously not all the same. But, like, you know with a commissioner, when you get an idea in that they really like, like, you know, they will be excited by it and you can tell and they will have it, you know, in front of the controller the next week or they will mention it or they will run into them, you know, when they're making a cup of tea and they will take it forward. And I think that's, you sort of know with all commissioners if they're going to, you know, if they're going to bite, they normally bite quite quickly. But I think all the channels are very different. I think five, channel five in a way, is the closest to AI model as you get. And I mean this as an absolute compliment. I think they, uh, Ben knows his audience so well and, and then has, and the commissioning team has learned that. So they literally can, they, they go, no, 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 possibly. And they make an incredibly quickly, quick decision in a way that no other channel does. Probably because you know, it's a smaller channel, has a smaller audience, so they, they have that benefit of being able to know the audience in a way that you know, BBC One audience, ITV One audience is so broad, you'll never be able to do that in the same way. But it is, I think it's, it's fascinating how at Five they've, they've mastered it. You know, it's, it's a real art of being able to know what will work. 
Because all their ideas are so simple, aren't they? It's like, yeah. it's like GPs, bailiffs, vets. You know, like <laughs> yeah. it's really straightforward. So if you go into a pitch, you need twice as many or three times as many ideas than you do for any other channel because they know immediately. They hear one word and they've decided whether or not it can work for them. Whether, you know, whether they like it or not, they can, mm. you can get through an idea every two minutes there, which is quite impressive. And they don't make you write up the entire yeah. programme. Yeah. The, the 12 page uh, document is you don't you don't do that for channel mm. five and then also when a commission is good slash bad slash useful at listening and taking on ideas do you think the system works as it stands currently works if you get a commission <laughs> <laughs> pain in the ass if you don't <laughs> i mean i feel, I, 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 I the, the leaders, the leaders debate um, uh, yesterday. I mean, God, those poor bastards. I, 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 you know, it is, it is hard, isn't it? I think there is always going to be this tension. And I thought what was, what was, what was difficult about that leaders debate? It was, it was so them and us, as if, yeah. as and if we're warring like enemies. And, it, and I don't think it does. I don't think it does feel like that. So there are frustrations. There are frustrations when you've worked really hard and rewritten a treatment over and over and over again, and it's still a few months down the line. And you sort of know the momentum's gone out of this. It's not going to happen but I still keep prodding because it's like I deserve the courtesy of a no at least yeah um, but just like in the marigold ex example that are you know the best commissioning editors really add to ideas and it yeah. is very much a collaboration um, and I think it's very rare the ideas go from being exactly what's in the mm. treatment. That's why I don't know why they're so obsessed with those treatments, you know, in asking you to rewrite it a million times. It's not going to be the treatment. Anyway, oh. so it go, goes on a process, doesn't it? And uh, First Dates is another example that I've mentioned before where uh, was Nick Mursky had the idea for the final two shots of the couple together saying, are you going to see each other again? And you were a bit like, oh, are you actually, you know, are they going to do it? And it absolutely makes the show. So I think, you know, when it works well, it works really well. When it doesn't work so well, when I find it frustrating is when you pitch something to a commissioning editor and they absolutely love it, and then they come back and say, oh, my boss didn't like it, mm. so it's not going to go to the channel controller. And then in those cases, you kind of think, what's the point of view then? If, you're not <laughs> and seriously, you know, if, if certain commissioning editors are not allowed to fight for their ideas and put it in front of the controllers, then you think, well, I'm not having a meeting with you anymore. I'm just going to go to your boss because... If, if you're not allowed to really, you know, champion something that you believe in, then, then it becomes frustrating. Yeah, lots of them have the power to say no, but not the power to say yes. Yeah. And was, was First Dates for Channel 4? No, well, no. So <laughs> I've, I think I've said this before, but again, it's, it's interesting how something, a, someone's bad idea will be someone else's hit. So um, we developed it originally for Sky Living, and we pitched it to Sky Living. And that was an example that this commissioning editor really loved it. Her boss didn't. Mm. Uh, so it never went to Channel Controller, and then, thank God, and then it went to Channel 4 instead. Uh, and then it became slightly different. As I say, we, we sort of worked on it with Nick um, and the team there, um, and, and then it, it became a big hit for the channel. I mean, what's interesting is you're talking about commissioners making an emotional decisions about a thing they may or may not like. Um, in your and again, obviously, I'm a data person, right? So in your experience, do you see people like looking at audience figures, looking at like, the state of the nation, thinking about, would the, is this rele relevant to an audience in a few months' I'll time? I'll tell you what picture? they always do, and, it, and it, they, you always get asked why now. So you've always got to have a couple of studies up your sleeve to sort of prove your point. And sometimes with the why now question, I want to go just because it'll be entertaining. Yeah. Mm. But there was a study recently done which okay. showed people are thinking about this. Mm. So we constantly have to justify the idea above and beyond it would just be a good story yeah. um, so we use data a lot for for, for that but then do, do, the, do you think the commissioners go go back and log into a system and look at like the viewing figures for all the similar types of shows and look at the you know what what demographic they are and then I think, think they're doing that more and more yeah. like bbc3 i think damien absolutely does that i think they're really tapped into their audience and what they're watching and they are behaving a lot more in the way that we hear Netflix does. I think we don't have the detail, you know, it's mm. not as data driven as that. But I think, for example, um, when I have conversations with Damien Kavanagh, he always says, he's not the BBC Three audience. He's very, you know, mm. aware of that, um, as I'm not, but he's, he's surrounded himself with viewers. But also I think they look a lot at data and what that audience is actually watching, who are the people that are relevant to them. And I think they do make decisions informed by that in a way that makes sense. Because oh. it is very, sorry, it's just very, it is frustrating sometimes we pitch an idea to, I don't know, an E4 idea to a commissioning editor who, who will then say, I wouldn't watch it. And you're kind of thinking, 
I'm not making it for you. You're yeah. not supposed yeah. to be watching that show. <laughs> um, so I think there should be more of that, more of the, of the commissioning actors thinking, who am I making this for? And does it matter if I don't like this talent? Does it matter if I yeah. don't like... I mean, what would, would, what would be interesting with AI is... is, is all commissioning editors are a product of the background before them and the yeah. TV that they've seen. So it's less going back and looking at figures. It's you sort of know, oh, that sh sort of show's been tried before and it, and, it, and it doesn't work. And actually, if we could clear all our brains of all the stuff that hasn't worked in the past, because, yeah. I mean, there was a moment in time where you couldn't get dating on for love nor money. Yeah. Everyone said dating wouldn't work. Yeah. And they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong. Um, but because a couple of dating shows hadn't worked, and then that becomes the yeah, it comes to, it becomes part of the, the razzle myth. ditch. I yeah. mean, the interesting thing is, if you, I mean, for example, like obviously Love Island, um, I, I would I would put, I would say that it's actually a victim of of effectively what's going on in the world yeah. as opposed to the pro show itself because it was on obviously early 2000s when people had more money and everyone was doing houses up and everyone was like, yeah, look, at, I can get 20 mortgages, and no, no, and, you know, and the shows were all about. You know, creating more wealth and those types of shows sort of fell by the wayside and now we sort of fast forward to 2015, 2016, Brexit, Trump, everything's shit uh, you know, and I want to, a complete escape from it. So a show that maybe wouldn't have worked then mm. is that that becomes part uh, you know, of the environment and then becomes more successful. Is, would you agree? With that sort of? But also it's made brilliantly, which yeah. is... I mean, a, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, timing's everything. I mean, we've got ideas at the moment that are in funding that we might have tried two years ago and it wasn't the right time and then something will change. You the dusted them off, taken time. them out of the bottom drawer, dusted <laughs> yeah, them off. Absolutely. We never, we never forget an idea. Every top line we have, we write down and store, even if, you know, even if, we, even if it never gets to treatment. Every, yeah. Everything that we think of is stored in an archive so that we can go back and, you know, and revisit it later. Cool. Now I've got three questions on the tablet. Oh, so exciting. They're not AI generated, I don't think. <laughs> and by the way, all this information, you might think it's irrelevant. It's not, because I'm listening and I'll be feeding it into the model. This is the <laughs> stuff I really need in order to make the winning programme next year. Um, so what's the best bit of advice in terms of coming up with and then pitching an idea? Something AI couldn't do currently, I added the currently. I think focus. I think if you run a development team that is chasing too many things and too many yeah. subjects, you don't do anything, you don't do anything well, you don't do anything right. I think it's about trying to find something in the real world, something yeah. that, you know, make it about something. Um, I always try to ask people to come with a story or an example of something that's real rather than just coming up with something that feels like an idea for a TV show that it's, you know, in the ether. I think it always helps when you can start your pitch by saying, this is happening or this happened, therefore this is the TV show. I think it's... If you can come up with an original mechanic, that's the hardest thing you can possibly do, but it's also the thing that'll get commissioners the most excited. So when 2.4 created this, uh, this time next year, nobody had ever thought about making a shot like that. It was a completely revolutionary mechanic. And then that was the easiest thing that we could possibly sell. Even Marigold, that kind of group travelogue thought was completely original. Nobody had done anything like that. And those were some of the easiest shows that we had ever sold. Mm. Uh, you know, so if, you can, so if you can have an original mechanic, keep it, apply it to everything that you can possibly think of, and then take it everywhere you possibly can. Yeah, rip yourself off before someone else yeah. does it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, pretend that, that you're only taking it to that channel. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> another question from the pad. Uh, what do you think would happen if all commissioners were replaced with artificial intelligence? Would we even notice? <laughs> Get quicker decisions, wouldn't we? Yeah. Instant, instant yeah. decisions. I, I mean, I, I, I don't know, because I think, I think sometimes you can't predict what are going to be the hits. Yeah. So broadcasters will tend to retrofit a story to match yeah. the hit, but actually they didn't know that one or, or that one. I mean, you could, you, 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 you could just throw some yeah. shit at the wall and, <laughs> also, <laughs> see what sticks. and also I think you would miss <laughs> that collaboration, the, collabor you know, the collaboration bit. You might get quicker decisions, but you won't necessarily take the idea to, to become the best version of it. People might not know what they want as well. I pres like your model, if it looks yes. at what people are talking about, like people weren't talking about, you know, where they were going to retire in the world. People probably yeah. weren't talking about school teachers. People weren't joining about the Royal Marines. Mm. Like, lots of our biggest hits. Mm. It would be like, I don't think we could have possibly got to them through social media sentiment. Yeah. Mm. I mean, and it's, I know it, there's more to your model. Yeah, that. there's more to Sorry. I mean, but, it's, but it's, a, it's a good point. Cause the, the, the point is actually um, we all limit 
effectively, even I limit the machine by what I think. Okay, and it's when the machine becomes to a point where it can not only think what I or tell me what I would like, but actually then gets into a position to be able to make what I would like at scale, but then being able to make it relevant to every single person that it's pushing a different bit of content to. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like advertising now, you know, advertising is still shit, but actually now it's done by AI and we get something which is a little bit more relevant than we used to. Mm. And it's like, if you think about that applied to programming, then it suddenly becomes a little bit terrifying, no? Well, or I thought it was really interesting in the BBC4 um, controller session yesterday, Kassan said that they are handing over BBC4 to an AI algorithm for the scheduling and that they've built a BBC4 bot that is trolling through BBC archives to identify uh, old shows that have a BBC4 DNA and they're going to try mm. those. I think that's really interesting. It's another use of... But well, everything has a formula. I mean, even nature, you know, Fibonacci sequence, there is a formula attached to everything, although we don't believe there is. You, you can effectively build a, a structure around something and then it might work, it might not work, but there is a, a way of looking at that. Um, there's two quick questions. Um, sh should, shouldn't we all be terrified of AI, especially when it comes to letting it control our viewing choices? Oh, what you mean, what it, what it suggests you should view. Um, well, we, I, I, we quite liked it yesterday, actually, because the commissioning editor um, um, was prompted by Amazon to buy the repair shop box set. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that, was, that was quite nice. I think there is that danger of, it's like when you go on Netflix and because you watched two minutes of something, it suggests, keeps suggesting stuff that you're like, no, I don't actually like that. And then you some, sometimes, I'll, 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 I don't know, there's a movie that I want to watch and then I find out it is there, but it never suggested to me. So yeah. I think it's perfect. It's whether, you know, can, it, and as you say, sometimes you don't know what you want to watch until you watch it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's tricky, isn't it? And the final question, Christian, can you pinpoint format points and make a show a success? Not yet, because if I did, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be in my own island. Um, <laughs> so um, does your view differ to the panels? Well, it doesn't, because I don't have one yet. Um, now, with that, um, we are out of time. Um, I think you'll find, uh, it, I mean, obviously, my model, quite crude, quite Heath Robinson. But with the, the brains and the, and the training that you guys have, you know, in the next couple of years, surely, it should be churning out ideas which, you know, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference and potentially could be BAFTA winning, though. No? <laughs> And with that, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. thank you very much. Thanks to the panel. Thank you.